This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Vein by Chrétien de Troy. Translated by W. W. Comfort. Section 9. My brave and courteous Lord of Aim was the first to speak, but his good friend was unable to recognize him by his utterance, for he was prevented by his low tone, and by his voice which was hoarse, weak, and broken, for his blood was all stirred up by the blows he had received. My Lord, he says, the night comes on. I think no blame or reproach will attach to us if the night comes between us, but I am willing to admit, for my own part, that I feel great respect and admiration for you, and never in my life have I engaged in a battle which has made me smart so much, nor did I ever expect to see a knight whose acquaintance I should so yearn to make. You know well how to land your blows, and how to make good use of them. I have never known a knight who was so skilled in dealing blows. It was against my will that I received all the blows you have bestowed upon me to-day. I am stunned by the blows you have struck upon my head. Upon my word, my lord Gawain replies, you are not so stunned and faint, but that I am as much so, or more. And if I should tell you the simple truth, I think you would not be loath to hear it, for if I have lent you anything of mine, you have fully paid me back, principal and interest, for you are more ready to pay back than I was to accept the payment. But however that may be, since you wish me to inform you of my name, it shall not be kept from you. My name is Gawain, the son of King Lot. As soon as my lord Yvain heard that, he was amazed and sorely troubled. Angry and grief-stricken, he cast upon the ground his bloody sword and broken shield, then dismounted from his horse and cried, Alas, what mischance is this? Through what unhappy ignorance in not recognizing each other have we waged this battle? For if I had known who you were, I should never have fought with you, but, upon my word, I should have surrendered without a blow. How is that? my lord Gawain inquires. Who are you, then? I am a vain, who love you more than any man in the whole wide world, for you have always been fond of me, and shown me honour in every court. But I wish to make you such amends, and do you such honour in this affair, that I will confess myself to have been defeated. Will you do so much for my sake? my gentle lord Gawain asks him. Surely I should be presumptuous to accept any such amends from you. This honour shall never be claimed as mine, but it shall be yours, to whom I resign it. Ah, fair sire, do not speak so, for that could never be. I am so wounded and exhausted that I cannot endure more. Surely you have no cause to be concerned, his friend and companion replies. But for my part, I am defeated and overcome. I say it not as a compliment, for there is no stranger in the world to whom I would not say as much, rather than receive any more blows. Thus saying, he got down from his horse, and they threw their arms about each other's neck, kissing each other, and each continuing to assert that it is he who has met defeat. The argument is still in progress when the king and the knights come running up from every side, at the sight of their reconciliation, and great is their desire to hear how this can be, and who these men are who manifest such happiness. The king says, Gentlemen, tell us now who it is that has so suddenly brought about this friendship and harmony between you two, after the hatred and strife there has been this day. Then his nephew, my lord Gawain, thus answers him, My lord, you shall be informed of the misfortune and mischance which have been the cause of our strife. Since you have tarried in order to hear and learn the cause of it, it is right to let you know the truth. I, Gawain, who am your nephew, did not recognize this companion of mine, my lord Yvain, until he fortunately, by the will of God, asked me my name. After each had informed the other of his name, we recognized each other, but not until we had fought it out. Our struggle already has been long, and if we fought yet a little longer, it would have fared ill with me, for, by my head, he would have killed me, what with his prowess, and the evil cause of her who chose me as her champion. 
but I would rather be defeated than killed by a friend in battle. Then my lord Yvain's blood was stirred, as he said to him in reply, Fair dear sire, so help me God, you have no right to say so much. Let my lord the king well know in this battle I am surely the one who has been defeated and overcome. I am the one, no I am, thus each cries out, and both are so honest and courteous that each allows the victory and the crown to be the other's prize, while neither one of them will accept it. Thus each strives to convince the king and all the people that he has been defeated and overthrown. But when he had listened to them for a while, the king terminated the dispute. He was well pleased with what he heard, and with the sight of them in each other's arms, though they had wounded and injured each other in several places. My lords, he says, there is deep affection between you two. You give clear evidence of that, when each insists that it is he who has been defeated. Now leave it all to me, for I think I can arrange it in such a way that it will redound to your honour, and every one will give consent. Then they both promised him that they would do his will in every particular, and the king says that he will decide the quarrel fairly and faithfully. Where is the damsel, he inquires, who has ejected her sister from her land, and has forcibly and cruelly disinherited her? My lord, she answers, here I am. Are you there? Then draw near to me. I saw plainly some time ago that you were disinheriting her, but her right shall no longer be denied, for you yourself have avowed the truth to me. You must now resign her share to her. Sire, she says, if I uttered a foolish and thoughtless word, you ought not to take me up in it. For God's sake, sire, do not be hard on me. You are a king, and you ought to guard against wrong and error. The king replies, that is precisely why I wish to give your sister her rights, for I have never defended what is wrong, and you have surely heard how your knight and hers have left the matter in my hands. I shall not say what is altogether pleasing to you, for your injustice is well known. In his desire to honour the other, each one says that he has been defeated. But there is no need to delay further, since the matter has been left to me, Either you will do in all respects what I say, without resistance, or I shall announce that my nephew has been defeated in the fight. That would be the worst thing that could happen to your cause, and I shall be sorry to make such a declaration. In reality, he would not have said it for anything, but he spoke thus in order to see if he could frighten her into restoring the heritage to her sister, for he clearly saw that she never would surrender anything to her, for any words of his, unless she was influenced by force or fear. In fear and apprehension, she replied to him, Fair Lord, I must now respect your desire, though my heart is very loath to yield. Yet, however hard it may go with me, I shall do it, and my sister shall have what belongs to her. I give her your own person as a pledge of her share in my inheritance, in order that she may be more assured of it. Endow her with it, then, at once, the king replies, let her receive it from your hands, and let her vow fidelity to you. Do you love her as your vassal, and let her love you as her sovereign lady, and as her sister. Thus the king conducts the affair, until the damsel takes possession of her land, and offers her thanks to him for it. Then the king asks the valiant and brave knight who was his nephew, to allow himself to be disarmed, and he requested my lord Yvain to lay aside his arms also, for now they may well dispense with them. Then the two vassals lay aside their arms, and separate on equal terms. And while they are taking off their armour, they see the lion running up in search of his master. As soon as he catches sight of him, he begins to show his joy. Then you would have seen people draw aside, and the boldest among them takes to flight. My lord Yvain cries out, Stand still, all! Why do you flee? No one is chasing you. Have no fear that yonder lion will do you harm. Believe me, please, when I say that he is mine, and I am his, and we are both companions. Then it was known of a truth by all those who had heard tell of the adventures of the lion and of his companion, 
that this must be the very man who had killed the wicked giant. And my lord Gawain said to him, Sir companion, so help me God, you have overwhelmed me with shame this day. I did not deserve the service that you did me in killing the giant to save my nephews and my niece. I have been thinking about you for some time, and I was troubled because it was said that we were acquainted as loving friends. I have surely thought much upon the subject, but I could not hit upon the truth, and had never heard of any knight that I had known in any land where I had been, who was called the Knight with the Lion. While they chatted thus, they took their armor off, and the lion came with no slow step to the place where his master sat, and showed such joy as a dumb beast could. Then the two knights had to be removed to a sick room and infirmary, for they needed a doctor and plaster to cure their wounds. King Arthur, who loved them well, had them both brought before him, and summoned the surgeon whose knowledge of surgery was supreme. He exercised his art in curing them, until he had healed their wounds as well and as quickly as possible. When he had cured them both, my lord Yvain, who had his heart set fast on love, saw clearly that he could not live, but that he finally would die unless his lady took pity on him, for he was dying for love of her. So he thought he would go away from the court alone, and would go to fight at the spring that belonged to her, where he would cause such a storm of wind and rain that she would be compelled perforce to make peace with him. Otherwise there would be no end to the disturbance of the spring and to the rain and wind. As soon as my lord Yvain felt that he was cured and sound again, he departed without the knowledge of any one. But he had with him his lion, who never in his life wished to desert him. They travelled until they saw the spring and made the rain descend. Think not that this is a lie of mine, when I tell you that the disturbance was so violent that no one could tell the tenth part of it, for it seemed as if the whole forest must surely be engulfed. The lady fears for her town, lest it, too, will crumble away. The walls totter, and the tower rocks so that it is on the verge of falling down. The bravest Turk would rather be a captive in Persia than be shut up within those walls. The people are so stricken with terror that they curse all their ancestors, saying, Confounded be the man who first constructed a house in this neighborhood, and all those who built this town. For in the wide world they could not have found so detestable a spot, for a single man is able here to invade and worry and harry us. You must take counsel in this matter, my lady, says Lunette. You will find no one who will undertake to aid you in this time of need, unless you seek for him afar. In the future we shall never be secure in this town, nor dare to pass beyond the walls and gate. You know full well that, were someone to summon together all your knights for this cause, the best of them would not dare to step forward. If it is true that you have no one to defend your spring, you will appear ridiculous and humiliated. It will redound greatly to your honor, forsooth, if he who has attacked you shall retire without a fight. Surely you are in a bad predicament if you do not devise some other plan to benefit yourself. The lady replies, Do thou, who art so wise, tell me what plan I can devise, and I will follow thy advice. Indeed, lady, if I had any plan, I should gladly propose it to you, but you have great need of a wiser counsellor. So I shall certainly not dare to intrude, and in common with the others I shall endure the rain and wind until, if it please God, I shall see some worthy man appear here in your court who will assume the responsibility and burden of the battle. But I do not believe that that will happen today, and we have not yet seen the worst of your urgent need. Then the lady replies at once, Damsel, speak now of something else. Say no more of the people of my household, for I cherish no further expectation that the spring in its marble brim will ever be defended by any of them. But, if it please God, let us hear now what is your opinion and plan, for people always say that in time of need one can test his friend. My lady, if there is any one who thinks he could find him who slew the giant and defeated the three knights, he would do well to go to search for him. 
but so long as he shall incur the enmity, wrath, and displeasure of his lady, I fancy there is not under heaven any man or woman whom he would follow, until he had been assured upon oath that everything possible would be done to appease the hostility which his lady feels for him, and which is so bitter that he is dying of the grief and anxiety it causes him. And the lady said, Before you enter upon the quest, I am prepared to promise you upon my word, and to swear that, if he will return to me, I will openly and frankly do all I can to bring about his peace of mind. Then Lunette replies to her, Lady, have no fear that you cannot easily effect his reconciliation, when once it is your desire to do so. But, if you do not object, I will take your oath before I start. I have no objection, the lady says. With delicate courtesy, Lunette procured at once for her a very precious relic, and the lady fell upon her knees. Thus Lunette very courteously accepted her upon her oath. In administering the oath, she forgot nothing which it might be an advantage to insert. Lady, she says, now raise your hand. I do not wish that the day after tomorrow you should lay any charge upon me for you are not doing anything for me, but you are acting for your own good. If you please now, you shall swear that you will exert yourself in the interests of the knight with the lion, until he recovers his lady's love, as completely as he ever possessed it. The lady then raised her right hand and said, I swear to all that thou hast said, so help me God and his holy saint, that my heart may never fail to do all within my power. If I have the strength and ability, I will restore to him the love and favor which with his lady he once enjoyed. Lunette has now done well her work. There was nothing which she had desired so much as the object which she has now attained. They had already got out for her a palfrey with an easy pace. Gladly, and in a happy frame of mind, Lunette mounts and rides away, until she finds beneath the pine tree him who she did not expect to find so near at hand. Indeed, she had thought that she would have to seek afar before discovering him. As soon as she saw him, she recognized him by the lion, and coming towards him rapidly, she dismounted upon the solid earth. And my lord Yvain recognized her as soon as he saw her, and greeted her as she saluted him with the words, Sire, I am very happy to have found you so near at hand. My lord Yvain said in reply, How is that? Were you looking for me then? Yes, sire, and in all my life I have never felt so glad, for I have made my mistress promise, if she does not go back upon her word, that she will be again your lady, as was once the case, and that you shall be her lord. This truth I make bold to tell. My lord Yvain was greatly elated at the news he hears, and which he had never expected to hear again he could not sufficiently show his gratitude to her who had accomplished this for him. He kisses her eyes and then her face, saying, Surely, my sweet friend, I can never repay you for this service. I fear that ability and time will fail me to do you the honor and service which is your due. Sire, she replies, have no concern, and let not that thought worry you for you will have an abundance of strength and time to show me and others your good will. If I have paid this debt I owed, I am entitled to only so much gratitude as the man who borrows another's goods and then discharges the obligation. Even now I do not consider that I have paid you the debt I owed. Indeed you have, as God sees me, more than five hundred thousand times. Now, when you are ready, let us go. But have you told her who I am? No, I have not, upon my word. She knows you only by the name of The Knight with the Lion. Thus conversing they went along, with the lion following after them, until they all three came to the town. They said not a word to any man or woman there, until they arrived where the lady was. And the lady was greatly pleased as soon as she heard that the damsel was approaching and that she was bringing with her the lion and the knight, whom she was very anxious to meet and know and see. All clad in his arms, my lord Yvain fell at her feet upon his knees, while Lunette, who was standing by, said to her, 
Raise him up, lady, and apply all your efforts and strength and skill in procuring that peace and pardon which no one in the world, except you, can secure for him. Then the lady bade him rise and said, He may dispose of all my power. I shall be very happy, if possible, to accomplish his wish and his desire. Surely, my lady, Lunette replied, I would not say it if it were not true. But all this is even more possible for you than I have said. But now I will tell you the whole truth, and you shall see. You never had, and you never will have, such a good friend as this gentleman. God, whose will it is that there should be unending peace and love between you and him, has caused me to find him this day so near at hand. In order to test the truth of this, I have only one thing to say. Lady, dismiss the grudge you bear him, for he has no other mistress than you. This is your husband, my lord of Aim. The lady, trembling at these words, replied, God save me! You have caught me neatly in a trap. You will make me love, in spite of myself, a man who neither loves nor esteems me. This is a fine piece of work, and a charming way of serving me. I would rather endure the winds and the tempests all my life, and if it were not a mean and ugly thing to break one's word, he would never make his peace or be reconciled with me. This purpose would have always lurked within me, as a fire smoulders in the ashes, but I do not wish to renew it now, nor do I care to refer to it, since I must be reconciled with him. My lord Yvain hears and understands that his cause is going well, and that he will be peacefully reconciled with her. So he says, Lady, one ought to have mercy on a sinner. I have had to pay, and dearly to pay, for my mad act. It was madness that made me stay away, and I now admit my guilt and sin. I have been bold indeed in daring to present myself to you, but if you will deign to keep me now, I never again shall do you any wrong. She replied, I will surely consent to that, for if I did not do all I could to establish peace between you and me, I should be guilty of perjury. So, if you please, I grant your request. Lady, says he, so truly as God in this mortal life could not otherwise restore me to happiness, so may the Holy Spirit bless me five hundred times. Now my Lord Yvain is reconciled, and you may believe that, in spite of the trouble he has endured, he was never so happy for anything. All has turned out well at last, for he is beloved and treasured by his lady, and she by him. His troubles no longer are in his mind, for he forgets them all in the joy he feels with his precious wife. And Lunette, for her part, is happy too. All her desires are satisfied when once she had made an enduring peace between my polite Lord of Aine and his sweetheart, so dear and elegant. Thus Chrétien concludes his romance of the night with the lion, for I never heard any more told of it. Nor will you ever hear any further particulars, unless someone wishes to add some lies. End of the Vein by Chrétien de Troyes, translated by W. W. Comfort.